Before your break, we discussed two processor elements, the Unibus control and the data manipulation logic. Now we're going to talk about the third major element, the general purpose registers. Every PDP-11 processor has a number of internal storage elements, referred to as general purpose registers or GPRs. Large processors, such as the 1145 and 1170, have 16 of these registers. The small and medium-sized PDP-11 processors have eight GPRs. Let's begin by looking at those processors which have eight GPRs. The eight general purpose registers are numbered R0 through R7. A specific address is assigned to each register so that it can be both read and loaded. Note that they are all 16-bit registers. Registers R0 through R5 are multi-purpose registers. These six registers are not dedicated to any specific function. Instead, their use is determined by the instruction which is decoded. Let's look at some of these uses. The six multipurpose registers can be used for operand storage. In other words, they can be used to store the actual data that we wish to modify. In this example, the number five is stored in R0 and the number two is stored in R3. When our add instruction is decoded, it tells the CPU to add the contents of these two registers and store the result in R3. Once the instruction is executed, you can see that nothing has changed except the contents of R3, which now contains the sum of the two operands, or 7. This is another example using the GPRs for operand storage. In this case, we want to subtract the number in R2 from the number in R5 and store the result back in R5. Again, notice that nothing changes except the value in R5. As we have seen in these two examples, general purpose registers R0 through R5 can be used as accumulators. This provides the quickest access to operands since they are already stored in the processor, there's no need to perform a bus cycle in order to retrieve the operands. These general purpose registers also allow the processor to access data stored anywhere in our PDP-11 system. Here, register R2 contains the value 005232. This value is the address of a memory location containing the operand 177000. Any of the registers can also be used for automatic incrementing. In other words, a value such as 005232 is first loaded into the selected register. Then this value is auto-incremented by the ALU. This value may be a starting address of a series of memory locations. Using register R2 in this way permits the processor to automatically step through consecutive memory locations. Notice in this example that the address in R2 is auto-incremented by two because we are retrieving full words. By simply reversing the auto-increment function, we can use the general purpose registers for automatic decrementing. In this example, we decrement the address stored in R2 in order to step through consecutive word locations in the reverse order. General purpose registers R0 through R5 can also be used as index registers for program relocation. The purpose of program relocation is to move an entire program from one area of memory to a completely different area. Rather than rewrite the entire program, we can simply use an index register to accomplish the move. Let's see how this is done. We'll use register R2 as an index register so we can relocate our program. Notice that R2 contains the value 026000. This value is used as an index or base. This base value can be summed with the original memory addresses to form the new addresses. Thus, the first instruction, add R0 to R3, has a memory address of 020000. When this address is summed with the base value in R2, it produces a new memory address of 046000. 
Because we can change the value in R2 whenever we want, we can move a program to any area of memory without having to rewrite the program. We've covered registers R0 through R5. Let's skip R6 for the moment and discuss R7, which is used as the system program counter, or PC. The purpose of the program counter is to point to the next instruction word in the program to be executed. As soon as an instruction is fetched from memory, the program counter is automatically incremented by two to point to the next instruction word. For example, when the first instruction is fetched, in this case, add R0 to R3, the program counter is automatically incremented to 020002. The new value appearing in the PC is the address of the next instruction. Subtract R2 from R5. Now, let's discuss register R6, which is used as the hardware stack pointer, or SP. In every PDP-11 system, a portion of memory is set aside for a hardware stack. This hardware stack plays a vital role whenever the current program is interrupted by a higher priority job. It allows the processor to temporarily store essential breakpoint data that it needs in order to return to the interrupted program. As you can see, the hardware stack is built by always placing the latest information at the top of the stack. Therefore, the last item placed on the stack will be the first item taken off. Here's where general purpose register R6 is used. R6 functions as our stack pointer, or SP. In other words, it always points to the latest entry on the stack. If we add more information, the stack pointer moves up again. It keeps moving up so that it always points to the top or latest entry in the stack. Conversely, if we remove information from the stack, the stack pointer automatically moves down. If we remove still another item, the stack pointer moves down again. As you can see from these examples, the stack pointer automatically moves up as items are added and automatically moves down as items are removed so that it always points to the latest entry in the hardware stack. Let's take a closer look at the information that is stored in the hardware stack. Assume that a device has interrupted the main program that was running in the processor. The processor responds by first decrementing the stack pointer. It then places a status word on the stack beginning at the location specified by R6. In this example, the location is 000700. The processor then auto decrements the stack pointer again and places the current PC value on the stack so it can start servicing this first interrupt. If a second interrupt occurs, the processor again stores the current status word and PC on the stack. In this case, it is the status word and PC from the routine handling the first interrupt. Notice how the stack pointer moved up to 000672 and is again pointing to the top entry in the stack. Suppose a third interrupt occurs. The same procedure is repeated and the stack pointer again moves up to point to the top entry in the stack. Notice what has been happening to the value in R6. It is automatically decremented by two before each word is put on the stack. Notice also that two words are stored in the stack for each interrupt. Thus, we can have interrupts interrupting interrupts, and it doesn't cause problems. In fact, it's not necessary for the programmer to keep track of the latest stack entry. That's handled automatically by our stack pointer. Once the third interrupt is serviced, the PC and status word for the second interrupt are removed from the stack. This allows us to return to the proper point in the handling routine for interrupt two. Once the second interrupt is serviced, the processor again removes a PC and status word that allows it to continue servicing the first interrupt. Notice how the stack pointer has been moving down. Remember, this is accomplished by automatically incrementing the value in R6, our stack pointer register. When the first interrupt has been serviced, the processor can remove these last two entries from the stack and go back to the proper spot in the main program. That completes our discussion of PDP-11 processors that employ eight general purpose registers. 
Now, let's take a closer look at the 16 registers that are used in the larger PDP-11 processors, such as the 1145 and 1170. In the large PDP-11 processors, there are 12 multipurpose registers instead of six. These registers are divided into two identical sets. Each set is labeled R0 through R5. These registers perform the same functions as the multipurpose registers used in the other PDP-11 processors. However, only one set of registers can be used at any given time. We could never, for instance, add the contents of R0 in set 0 to the contents of R3 in set 1. Because large processors such as the 1145 and 1170 have three operating modes, they also have three hardware stacks, and therefore three stack pointer registers. Notice that each register is called R6. This does not cause any problems because only one operating mode and associated stack can be used at any given time. All PDP-11 processors have just one program counter. After all, the processor can only execute one instruction at a time, therefore only one program counter is needed to keep track of the next instruction. That's all we care to say about these general purpose registers at this time. More detailed coverage will be provided in a later study unit dealing with the PDP-11 addressing modes. We've now covered the three major processor elements the Unibus control, the data manipulation logic, and the general purpose registers. The final topic in this study unit is the processor status word, or PSW. The PSW is stored in a 16-bit register located in the processor. This PSW register has its own address so that it can be both read and loaded. There are two points to remember about the PSW register address. First of all, the PSW address is part of the I.O. device address structure we've mentioned before. In other words, this address resides in the top 4K of the address space which is reserved for I.O. devices and internal processor registers. Secondly, only the processor can address the PSW register. This means that the PSW is available to the programmer but is not available to any other bus device. Now, let's examine the makeup of the processor status word. The first four bits in the PSW indicate the conditions resulting from the most recent instruction and are therefore called condition codes. The first condition code bit is a carry indicator. It is usually referred to as the C bit. If this bit is clear, it indicates that the results of the previous operation did not end with a carry. When set, this C bit indicates there was a carry. Here we have an example of an add instruction that resulted in a carry out of the most significant bit. In this case, execution of the add instruction causes the C bit to be set. The second condition code bit, bit 1, is an overflow indicator. It's called the V bit. When set, this V bit indicates that the operation resulted in an arithmetic overflow. As you can see in this example, adding two numbers with the same sign should result in a sum with the same sign. However, because of binary arithmetic, it results in an unlike sign or an arithmetic overflow. In this example, execution of the add instruction causes the v-bit to be set, thereby indicating that the add instruction has produced an arithmetic overflow. The third condition code bit, bit 2, is a zero indicator and is called the z-bit. When this Z bit is set, it indicates that the result of the operation was zero. As you can see in this example, the decrement instruction causes a result of zero, thereby setting the Z bit. The final condition code bit, bit three, is a negative indicator and it is known as the N bit. This N bit is set when the result of the operation is a negative value. In this example, the complement instruction changes a positive value to a negative result, and therefore the end bit is set. In summary, the first four bits of the PSW are known as condition codes because they indicate the condition or status of the results of the previous instruction. These four bits, when set, indicate a carry, 
an overflow, a zero, and a negative result. Bits five, six, and seven in the PSW establish a specific priority level for the processor. Hence, it is possible to raise or lower the CPU's priority by way of the processor status word. The highest CPU priority level is seven. The lowest is zero. The prime purpose of the processor's priority level is to mask or block out device interrupts appearing at one or more of the BR levels. For example, here we see the CPU set to a priority level of five. This means that the processor cannot be interrupted by any BR5 or BR4 device. However, it can service interrupts at BR6 or BR7. In this example, the processor's priority level is set at seven and thereby masks out all device interrupts. In other words, no device can interrupt the processor while PSW bits five, six, and seven are set to ones. The priority level of the processor can be continually changed by way of the PSW. For example, suppose our main program is running and the processor's priority level is currently at four. Suddenly, a disk interrupts because it needs servicing. As a result of this interrupt, a new PSW is loaded so that the CPU's priority level is elevated to five. This prevents any BR4 and BR5 device from interrupting the processor while it is servicing the disk. Should a higher priority device, such as a tape unit, issue an interrupt, the processor stops servicing the lower priority disk and loads a new word into the PSW register. As a result, its priority level is elevated to six, thereby masking all possible interrupts except those at the highest BR level, namely BR7. Once the tape unit is serviced, the CPU's priority level is lowered to five by loading a new PSW. This allows the disk service routine to continue at the point where it was interrupted. Once again, the disk is serviced. The CPU's priority level is again lowered to four so that the main program can continue. Notice how the priority level of the processor was elevated and lowered to accommodate devices according to their priorities. Now, let's return to the PSW. Bit four of the PSW is a trap bit and is therefore referred to as the T bit. When this T bit is set, it causes the processor to automatically trap to a debugging routine. The debugging routine can then be used to isolate and correct possible program or equipment malfunctions. Let's see what happens. When the T-bit is set, the processor completes execution of the current instruction and then issues a trap vector of 14. Vector 14 is the address of a memory location. This location contains the starting address of a debugging program. The processor retrieves and loads the starting address into its PC and then begins stepping through the debugging program in order to locate and correct the error or malfunction. Now we're going to look at the entire 16-bit PSW. The first four bits are condition code indicators that tell us certain facts about the results of the instruction that has just been executed. Next, there's a trap or T-bit that permits us to insert breakpoints for program debugging. The next three bits permit us to operate the processor at any one of eight priority levels. This allows the processor to mask or block out lower priority jobs until the more important jobs have been serviced. What about the remaining PSW bits? Well, bits eight through 10 are not used, but are available for system expansion. Remember the two register sets that are provided in the large PDP-11 processors, such as the 1145 and 1170? Bit 11 is used to select one of these two sets. The remaining PSW bits, 12 through 15, are used with memory management hardware and involve more advanced concepts that will not be covered in this introductory course. Before we wrap up this study unit, let's look at how the PSW is used. Assume that the processor is doing some job when an interrupt occurs. The processor stops the current job and, as we noted earlier, stores the current PC and PSW in the hardware stack. Now the processor takes a new PC and PSW from memory. 
The new PC tells the processor where to find the first instruction in the interrupt service routine. The new PSW gives the processor the initial status that is to be used when running the service routine, for instance, the appropriate priority level. The processor now loads and executes the routine in order to service the interrupt. Once the service routine is finished, the processor reloads the old PC and PSW so it can resume the interrupted program. The old PC points to the instruction that was going to be fetched before the interrupt occurred. The old PSW indicates the results of the instruction that was executed just prior to the interrupt. For example, it might indicate that the last instruction resulted in an overflow condition. The PSW also reestablishes the priority level which existed in the processor prior to the interrupt. Now that the original PC and PSW have been restored, the processor can continue the program where it left off. That completes our discussion of the PDP-11 processor. We'd now like you to take another test. This test is for your use. Based on the test results, either review the material in this study unit or proceed to the next study unit in the series. When you hear the next tone, turn off the playback unit and take the test located in your workbook.